Thank you, Warwick. I, uh, I was a bit nonplussed this uh, summer when, uh, after I'd submitted a short abstract for this meeting, which looked like an interesting meeting, uh, I guess Warwick thought my abstract was really junk because he uh, wrote me or sent me an email saying, uh, why don't you actually give an historical overview? And I thought, well, this is kind of strange. I've actually never been much interested in the history of science. Um, ever since Jewel Charney told me that the first sign of senility in a scientist was interest in the history of his field. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, but uh, nevertheless, I decided to uh, try to soldier on with this, and uh, and found it a, a bit interesting. Of, of course, uh, uh, I'm a bit worried that Dr. Brewer will be able to correct me in all too many ways. But uh, we'll start off. And uh, what I thought, uh, thinking about this, I think that. Approximately, one can divide the uh, history of the study of this Brewer-Dobson circulation into sort of five decades, more or less. I think the first in the 50s, I think we really move forward in understanding the transport circulation in the middle atmosphere because people who think like physicists were uh, attacking the problem through physical reasoning. And in the 60s, uh, thanks to the MIT school where I was uh, a graduate student at that time, I think we really went backwards with the or domination of the Eulerian mean uh, way of viewing the world. And then in the 70s with uh, Andrews and McIntyre and others, I think uh, theory moved us well forward. In the 80s then, um, benefiting from this theory, uh, lots of modeling um, moved forward. And in the 90s, I would say theory and observation with the upper atmosphere research satellite and uh, some of the uh, uh, theoretical work done here and elsewhere. Um, I think the last couple of decades are going to be covered by a lot of other people here, and so I will concentrate on these uh, first three decades. So, so what is the Brewer-Dobson circulation? Well, we've already seen uh, since uh, from uh, <laughs> from uh, Warwick this classic uh, figure from Brewer's paper, and I just like to keep you remind you or to keep this in mind now, this uh, beautiful uh, uh, diagram, these beautiful arrows showing this uh, circulation upward through the tropical tropopause, poleward and downward, with notice a concentration that's showing clearly that the brewer realizes was stronger in the winter hemisphere than in the summer hemisphere. Okay, And uh, as Warwick mentioned, the, uh, uh, the numbers were, uh, really uh, quite remarkable. Uh, this quote from the Brewer paper that the observed distribution of water vapor can be explained by the existence of a circulation of which air enters the stratosphere at the equator, dried by condensation and travels in the stratosphere to temperate and polar regions and so on. The idea of a stratosphere and radiative equilibrium must be abandoned. And he calculated then that there estimated a cooling rate in the high latitudes of 0.1 to 1.1 degree per day, but about a half a degree per day seemed most probable. And at the equator, the ascending air must be subject to heating by radiation. And it's interesting to see he didn't say the, ascend, the air was forced to ascend by heating, but rather pointed out that the, uh, <coughs> in order to ascend, it had to be heated. Okay, so, I'm sorry, I lost my place here. So after uh, reading, uh, reading Dobson's, I'm sorry, reading Brewer's paper and uh, in particular looking at that uh, conclusion and all, I was beginning to wonder, well, what was Dobson's role in all of this with my ignorance of the history? And uh, so I, but I did notice in uh, Brewer's paper that in, uh, towards the end of the paper, he has this quotation concerning the ozone distribution, which he says that the only way, he's quoting now Dobson's 1929 paper, that the only way in which we can reconcile observed high ozone in the Arctic spring and low concentration in the tropics with a hypothesis that ozone is formed by the action of the sunlight would be to suppose a general slow poleward drift in the highest atmosphere with a slow descent of air near the poles. Such a current would carry the ozone formed in low latitudes to the poles and concentrate it there. And when I read this quotation in Brewer's paper, I then was beginning to, to uh, wonder, well, maybe Dobson had figured it all out uh, 
in 1929, and so uh, we should really be celebrating the 70th anniversary of that paper. I went back and looked at Dobson's 1929 paper, and it's interesting that immediately after this paragraph, he goes on to cast doubt on whether this could possibly be true. So he's really here just sort of setting up a straw man and then says, well, no, that couldn't really, w wouldn't really work that way. Um, simply because uh, the uh, uh, yeah that that it really uh, couldn't work that way because there was no evidence in 1929 that the altitude of ozone maximum in the high latitudes was any lower than it was in low latitudes, uh, which he figured would be required for that sort of circulation to hold. Um, then. Uh, well, that was what I wondered too, because <laughs> all he, I presume that uh, he uh, uh, relied on uh, the uh, uh, Umcare sort of measurements, but, but perhaps, perhaps Dr. Brewer can say. It. Yeah, he was asking how. Uh, yeah. How did uh, Dobson speculate, or how did he know what altitude the ozone maximum was? Uh, talk about that. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, so it was clear that in 1929, then uh, uh, Dobson. Uh, hadn't solved the problem. We go on to 1946 in the paper by Dobson et al. Brewer and I'm sorry, how is this man's name? Sfilong. I would never have guessed that right. <laughs> and so even up to 1946 then they state that it's often been suggested the difference in temperature in the stratosphere in low and high latitudes is due to a general world circulation between the equator and pole which causes the air in the stratosphere to rise slowly near the equator and to subside slowly near the poles. And then he goes on, they go on though in this paper immediately to express doubts about whether this is, uh, is the case. I shall say that is Dobson. Okay. Dobson. This is what I thought, right? <laughs> this, this is interesting, yes. It was Dobson's lecture. Uh -huh. And I, 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 I like that. Excellent, excellent. I, I was hoping this would be, because I was very puzzled by it when I read this. Uh, okay, so, so let's then go on. In, in, in my own papers, I have traditionally, when I'm referring to this uh, circulation, following other people, have re, uh, cited Brewer 49 and Dobson 56. And so we go up to Dobson's paper in 56, and by then, uh, I guess he really had accepted the inevitable. But the schematic in his paper still doesn't look as good as Brewer's. This is Dobson 56, and you see he's, he does have the upward and uh, poleward circulation, but uh, and then he's got some sort of entirely separate uh, uh, advection of ozone from the polar high latitude or polar high altitudes down into the lower altitudes. But notice all these uh, um, dashed vertical arrows. Those all refer to turbulent, vertical uh, mixing by turbulence. And it's clear from reading his paper, he was still thinking, as the schematic shows, of, uh, thank you, of, of vertical mixing by turbulence as being a uh, predominant factor. Okay, so uh, the next point, really a point of progress that I see is towards the, was really at the um, end of the 50s and uh, actually extending to, uh, to uh, 1961. And uh, just since this is a personal uh, uh, viewpoint on the history, I say that in 1959 when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, I took my first course in meteorology from Richard Goody who had just arrived at Harvard at that point. And this course which concentrated on, on uh, radiation, um, Goody did remark that he thought that uh, at that point in 1959 we had the in necessary information to do calculate the heat budget of the stratosphere and he thought this would be a great project for a PhD thesis for somebody. And, uh, uh, had indicated he'd like me to stay at Harvard and work with him. Uh, 
on my PhD, which I decided not to do, and it was fortunate that I didn't take up that particular topic because, as we know, only a, two years later, in 61, Murgatroyd and Singleton, uh, in fact, published uh, their famous paper in which they worked out the heat budget of the middle atmosphere, and um, as a result of working out the heating and cooling rates, they then calculated what we now call the diabatic circulation and used that to produce six-month trajectories, assuming that the air was par air parcels were advected by this diabatic circulation. So this is quite looks like it looks quite modern now, really. See here in northern hemis, these show now six-month trajectories uh, uh, for. Uh, at a time into, uh, ending in northern hemisphere spring here. They did point out, however, that uh, there were serious problems in the uh, momentum budget here. That if you, for example, if you took an air parcel that's motionless at the equator and moved it to 60 north, uh, uh, conserving angular momentum, it would have a supersonic uh, eastward velocity. So clearly uh, uh, there was was a problem there, but they didn't address that uh, any more than Brewer or Dobson earlier had uh, addressed the momentum budget problem. I was all organized here when, earlier, and I seem to have gotten a bit disorganized. Okay, so that was uh, the status at about the um, uh, beginning of the 1960s when I started graduate school at MIT. And people at MIT, of course, were aware of, uh, of uh, Dobson and Brewer's work and of uh, Murgatroyd and Singleton's paper, but the uh, uh, message that the professors at MIT gave us all was that this stuff was all wrong, so you can ignore it, right? And uh, I found this uh, quote, in <laughs> which I think may be helpful in this point, because uh, I don't want to completely uh, denigrate my MIT uh, mentors and so on, but uh, in fact, uh, I think there was, uh, that we did lose a lot of time through the, uh, um, in the decade of the 60s, and really through two different uh, sorts of, uh, of, uh, of approaches. The first uh, thing that sort of put us on the wrong track were deductions that were made from looking at radioactive tracers. Remember the late 50s, uh, the United States uh, had extensive atmospheric nuclear testing in the tropical Pacific, and uh, uh, very early on, a few people, such as Dyer in Australia, uh, 1960, published a paper in which he argued that the uh, pattern of radioactive fallout measured on the ground at Melbourne, Australia, was consistent with the Brewer-Dobson circulation, and that the maximum was uh, observed there in um, Australia a few months after the uh, equatorial uh, uh, explosions, but then. At about the same time, Feely and Spar in the United States, basing their information upon uh, uh, observations of tungsten 185 in the stratosphere from U-2 aircraft. So way back then, we were already getting valuable information on transport from the U-2 aircraft. But uh, they found now this is uh, these are two month averages I think uh, September October and November December in 1958 uh, yes uh, so here is basically the source uh, region here and what they noted was that. Uh, if you looked at the tungsten 185 pattern, that they saw what was basically a rather rapid uh, transport meridionally, more or less along the isentropes, and very little evidence of this uh, upward and poleward advective circulation. So their argument was then that, well, that uh, Brewer and Dobson were, were basically were wrong, that we really had eddy, um, eddy motions mixing things along the uh, isentropes. Um, but paper? this paper is 1960. I'm oh, sorry, this paper, though no, Feeling Spar was 1960, this diagram is actually from a paper by Reggie Newell in uh, 63, I believe. Yes. That that's, uh, gives the best uh, the best uh, diagram. 
Uh, and so Reggie Newell at, at, at MIT was one of the uh, primary uh, backers of this uh, view that it was really meridional mixing that by eddies that was controlling the, the distribution of tracers as well as controlling the heat budget. Note, uh, one thing to note, however, uh, with a limitation we still have even today is that the highest altitude at which these measurements go is around, uh, of course, around 20 kilometers limited by the U-2 aircraft. And so one is really looking at only the very lowest part of the stratosphere, and I know we'll hear more in this uh, uh, later in this uh, week about the, uh, perhaps the special conditions in that lowest part of the stratosphere. That's amazing. Was the U-2 flying north and south? Yeah, we sure. Yeah, you know, there were lots of good things done even uh, even that long ago, Bill. <laughs> uh, so here, and this is just uh, to follow up, this is a quote of uh, Newell's that uh, large-scale quasi-horizontal eddies can transport ozone poleward in sufficient quantities to account for the spring buildup of ozone. Such large-scale mixing as opposed to mean meridional motions also allows explanation of the radioactive tungsten in the stratosphere. So that was his view at that time. And I even saw there was a paper by uh, Sawyer in 1965 in which he argued that uh, uh, basically, that to uh, um, explain the heat budget, that you didn't even didn't need to have a meridional circulation at all. That eddies could do it all. No need for a mean meridional circulation. The other sort of line of uh, of reasoning or research in the 60s that I think uh, took us backwards a bit was the Victor T Victor Starr School of General Circulation Research. The Eulerian mean uh, approach to understanding the circulation. And uh, for the stratosphere, uh, the best example of what I mean here is this paper, uh, Vincent, 1968, who uh, happened to have maybe the the most complete analysis of the mean meridian, Eulerian mean meridional circulation in the stratosphere. And what he found, or which has actually been found somewhat earlier, was that if you do your averaging on isobaric surfaces around latitude circles, that rather than seeing this uh, single cell per hemisphere Brewer-Dobson circulation, that there are two cells and with a uh, you know, with the reverse cell in the high latitudes, with upward motion in the poleward region and a downward motion in mid latitudes. And discovery of this uh, led then to uh, a lot of, well, when, certainly when I was uh, at MIT as a graduate student, we talked about a sort of a magical, seemed almost a magical situation in which the eddy motions were able to work against that uh, reverse Eulerian mean meridional circulation in just the right manner to produce the poleward and downward ozone transport and the poleward water transport. And it all basically did seem sort of like magic to us. Okay, so that brought us up uh, sort of to the end of the, uh, <coughs> the uh, end of the 60s and uh, and as far as I can tell, in the early part of the 70s, uh, there was fairly minimal activity in uh, the uh, study of transport in the uh, stratosphere. Um, and the next real uh, progress that I saw was in the 70s in the uh, work of Andrews and uh, McIntyre at uh, Cambridge. First, uh, uh, well, in both in the introduction of this generalized uh, Lagrangian mean and then the transformed or Lyrian mean, um, but one other one. There's in the opposite order. Yeah, I mean, it, right. In the opposite order. And this 1976 was the transformed or Lyrian mean, and 78 the Lagrangian mean. Is that right? Or right, right. But uh, and the this. Lagrange, this transformed Eulerian mean introduced in 1976, if you look at that paper, it's clear that uh, I think it's fair to say, Michael, you, you uh, uh, David, at that time really weren't uh, addressing the problems of tracer transport, right? You were looking at the momentum and heat budget of the stratosphere, and it was only a little later that uh, people started using this as a, as a way of uh, approximating the circuit to transport circulation. Uh, 
But uh, before that, actually, uh, already at right at the end of the 60s, uh, uh, Jerry Malman, in a an interesting paper, study of uh, general circulation model study, had pointed out that the way you do the averaging really makes a big difference. He found in his GCM that if you did the Eulerian mean averaging as the MIT school uh, would have you do it, that indeed his general circulation model showed this two cell circulation with the upward rising motion near the pole sinking in mid latitudes. But if he took an averaging scheme in which he averaged along the streamlines for the jet stream, so he defined the jet stream and then averaged with respect to the jet stream, he then found that he had a single cell very much like, uh, like uh, Brewer had originally shown. And, um, <coughs> And that paper really didn't, I don't think it had much influence for quite a, quite a while. Uh, I, I certainly don't remember uh, reading it and making much note of it. Um, but uh, after Andrews and McIntyre did their work on the uh, transformed Eulerian mean and the Lagrangian mean, uh, Wallace and then uh, Matsuno a little later uh, uh, gave a schematic interpretation to help people understand why the way you average really makes a, a difference and uh, as sort of towards the end. I'd like to just sort of go through that uh, quickly here and this is to, so here's a little weather map showing a planetary wave in the stratosphere and with the ridge and trough. Um, and for these uh, uh, propagating, uh, winter hemisphere propagating planetary waves, the upward motion and downward motion are concentrated or maximum just east of the ridge and east of the trough respectively. And now if you suppose you're taking an Eulerian mean average along a latitude circle one of these three latitude circles. Along this latitude circle, the Eulerian mean, because it's going through the down, downward circulation there, will give you a downward motion. Up here, at the higher latitudes, the Eulerian mean would give you a net upward motion. And, uh, oh, I forgot to say, by the way, we're, we're assuming this flow is adiabatic so that, in fact, uh, there is no net vertical motion. Parcels are moving along the isentropes. Now, however, if we take an average following the streamlines here, for example, along following S3, you can see that the upward and downward just cancel along here, upward and downward cancel. And along here, the upward and downward cancel. So an average that's taken following these streamlines here for adiabatic flow will give you no net vertical motion. And if assuming steady waves. Assuming steady waves. Adiabatic steady. And so the zonally average cross section then, we see that uh, the parcel motions then, or the motions along here, which will be parcel motions in steady state, are just these ellipses like this that are sort of uh, down, that have orientation and sort of uh, downward towards the poles, but no net vertical motion. So then if you assume then that you, ha you add uh, a radiative effect with radiative uh, heating at low latitudes and cooling at high latitudes, you get, instead of the uh, closed ellipses, you'll get these sorts of spirals with at high latitudes the flow spirals downwards and low latitudes it gradually uh, spirals upwards. And it's this, this aspect that the introduction of the transformed Eulerian mean was able to uh, uh, was able to, uh, uh, to to show us in a very very uh, uh, clear way that uh, if we essentially eliminated that part of the Eulerian mean vertical motion that's uh, just balancing the eddy heat fluxes, we're left with the vertical motion that's uh, the di diabatic, that is cross isentrope. Um, the, uh, give me time, uh, uh, um, remind me on the time too, okay? What do I have left, two minutes, three minutes? Five, Five minutes, okay. So, uh, uh, Dunkerton, when he was my student at, uh, at the UW then in 1978, uh, uh, 
was um, ha after reading the uh, Andrews and McIntyre on the Lagrangian mean and uh, thinking back to the Murgatroyd and Singleton paper, he quickly put it together in this uh, little note in which he uh, used a uh, very simplified version of the Andrews and McIntyre Lagrangian mean to uh, uh, together with the heating distribution from Murgatroyd and Singleton to show the circulation throughout the whole middle atmosphere with the mean transport streamlines uh, uh, as you see here with the sort of the Brewer-Dobson circulation in the stratosphere and then this single pole to pole solstice circulation in the, uh, in the mesosphere. Right. Um. Well, I'll skip forward through the uh, 1980s, and I want to just end with a couple of comments from the 1990s, uh, where with the, the work of uh, Haynes and his collaborators at uh, Cambridge, I think we now have, as Warwick suggested, a much better understanding now of what's forcing this uh, Brewer-Dobson circulation, which is the uh, upward propagation of waves, planetary waves, and gravity waves, and so on from the troposphere. Uh, wave breaking, uh, particularly planetary wave breaking in the uh, winter stratosphere, producing this uh, westward force, which uh, McIntyre gave the name wave driven pump to. So the idea is in this region, waves are breaking, they exert a westward force. Because the atmosphere, the Earth is rapidly rotating, you have that quasi-gyroscopic effect in which a westward force produces a poleward drift. The poleward drift here, produced by the westward uh, forcing, the momentum forcing then, will draw air up in the equatorial region, which will then become colder than radiative equilibrium, be radiatively heated, and push air down at high latitudes, uh, um, company, accompanied by radiative uh, cooling. Uh, so here is the Brewer-Dobson circulation, and now the momentum budget problem, which uh, was so difficult to understand back uh, when Brewer and Dobson, Murgatroyd and Singleton were working on this. That momentum budget problem really is, uh, is solved through this uh, wave breaking idea. At the same time, the uh, circulation, of course, this overturning circulation will transport uh, tracers and will tend to, uh, tend to raise, uh, ah, help, also. so that uh, a vertically stratified tracer then would tend to have its mixing ratio surfaces tilted like this by the effect of upward and downward motion. But the, at the same time, the wave breaking is producing mixing there in the uh, mid latitudes. And the effect of that mixing will be to tend to, to homogenize the tracer distribution in this region so that a typical uh, mixing ratio surface for a uh, tracer, uh, vertically stratified tracer, will end up looking something like this, lifted high in the tropics, downward, depressed downward in the polar vortex, and with a more or less uh, uh, level surface in the mid-latitudes. And that's just the sort of thing we see in these wonderful uh, data from the UR satellite and, for example, the uh, halo, the the methane as viewed by the halo instrument. This classic diagram now showing in the southern hemisphere uh, late, late winter where we see the high values of methane raised in the tropical region, very low values of methane uh, coming to low altitudes in the polar vortex and a more or less uh, homogenized region here in, in mid latitudes. And I think uh, with that I should uh, pretty well s stop, but I wanted to just go on to say that this uh, Brewer-Dobson circulation, of course, has recently become uh, a uh, uh, sort of the, the standard way in which one tries to explain and understand the global scale exchange between the troposphere and the stratosphere, which is really taking us now in 1999 back to 1949, where Brewer was explaining to us the stratosphere-troposphere exchange of water vapor. 
And uh, that turns out to be one of the primary problems we're still working on today. Uh, and that this uh, Brewer Dobson circulation is uh, worldwide now known as a, <laughs> is a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the review paper that uh, some of us here were involved with on stratosphere troposphere exchange has become of, of global importance now and this diagram which was provided to me uh, by a friend from the I think it's the Japanese version of physics today uh, uh, just illustrates now the uh, stratosphere uh, troposphere exchange uh, um, with the with some emphasis on the uh, water vapor here and uh, so with that, I will close. <laughs>